Today, I am joined by one of my best friends in the world, composer Dale Trumbor. Dale's music has been performed across the US and abroad by groups such as the LA Master Chorale, the American Contemporary Music Ensemble, Pasadena Symphony, and Vocal Essence. Dale has several albums out, including How to Go On with the Choral Arts Initiative, and she is the author of Staying Composed, overcoming anxiety and self-doubt within a creative life. Dale and I talk about what it's like to have anxiety and to take medication, and she shares her really wonderful advice about just dealing with thoughts of self-doubt when you are working as an artist, particularly during a global pandemic. Hi, Dale. Hi, Julia. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? <laughs> this is so much just what it is. This. <laughs> well, you're actually the only person that I've seen, other than my partner, like in real life. So it actually feels weird <laughs> to see you. Yeah, it is. That's really funny. I don't think we've like talked on Zoom before. How have you been doing? Um, what has the pandemic been like for you? Um, yeah, I'll just pretend I don't know. I know at the start of the pandemic, I felt really overwhelmed and just basically unable to get anything done. And then I had three pieces due in August and one got pushed, the deadline got pushed until January. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I thrive on deadlines. I'm really, really big on deadlines, as you know. Um, and so that was kind of the push I needed to get my act together in um, like, middle of June and July and finally start writing music again. And were you mostly writing choral pieces at the time when the pandemic hit? Because I know it it hit the choral world a little bit differently, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the one thing. Um, if obviously, if you're a soloist, you can be creating music during this time. But a chorus, really, by definition, is multiple people all singing together, right? All breathing together. And that's exactly what we've been uh, <laughs> trying not to do this entire pandemic. We've been instructed not to be breathing together. Um, so yeah, I think, I know now um, talking in the middle of September, we have uh, some choruses that are rehearsing with masks on, distant, some choruses are rehearsing. I know I just saw, um, a picture of one rehearsing in a parking garage, uh, very far apart, which at least the acoustics will be good. Um, That's true. <laughs> in a garage, yeah. But, um, but people are finding ways. I, I appreciate that people are finding ways to still make choral music happen. There were two pieces I wrote at the start, I think back in March, um, that were a response to the immediate need for music that could be made live over Zoom. And I didn't quite know what I was doing. And I've actually gone back and made little subtle edits to those um, for the groups who are uh, performing them now. Um, but they were really simple pieces that were designed to be performed live over video instead of in person. So yeah. what inspired you to write these Zoom choral pieces? And how did you approach those unique challenges? I think it was just seeing how hopeless everyone felt. I mean, I know I felt hopeless about um, having, I think I I went back and calculated how much money I'd lost um, from those first cancellations. And it was about $25,000, which is oh a lot. God. Um, Just in those first, what, six weeks or two months? Yeah, that's in wow. commissions. I had two commissioning projects fall through and then speaking gigs too um, right. and teaching uh like at a, a festival type things, all of that just vanished back in March. Um, so I like I was dealing with that, but also with um, seeing just through social media and my friends <laughs> seeing uh, conductors being like, I don't know what to do now. Like, how do we finish out the school year um, with nothing to perform? And so that's where these two pieces um, came from and one of them is called I hope you're doing well and it was the text is just all of the email sign offs I kept seeing and, and we're still doing that now I'm I keep writing I hope you're doing as well as humanly possible I was thinking about long distance relationships also when I wrote the text for that one mm -hmm. as well as this strange time where 
in a way, it actually feels like we're the same distance from everyone now. Like we're equidistant from people that we're close to. Like even you and I right. used to live around the corner from each other, right? right? But um, but when you can't see anyone, um, it's almost. I was kind of heartened by how. Um, it almost felt like a positive thing that suddenly I was talking to people I hadn't, I hadn't spoken to in months, um, and I was having all of those conversations alongside the ones with close, closer, geographically closer friends. Yeah, yeah. So how did you approach um, the difficulties of Zoom, and can you explain kind of why it's hard specifically for a choir over Zoom? Yeah. So I know. I think. Even Zoom has evolved a little bit to make sound, uh, concurrent sound better. But what what it was doing back in March and to some extent is still doing now um, is prioritizing one sound over another. So it kind of clips. If there's a lot of sounds happening, it chooses what to what to feature. Um, but I was in these pieces. I was trying to intentionally play with that, where um, we get a little bit. It's the the. Uh, priority in terms of what's happening in the sound is not harmony. It's um, it's more melodically driven and it allows for that choppiness and that jumping back and forth between voices. I was thinking almost about more about like um, rounds, like the piece isn't a round, but where you're intentionally, um, because the pieces also let, let people go at their own pace. Um, because I saw, I actually saw a video of a choir, I think trying to sing the hallelujah chorus and it was, it was a mess. It's funny. I mean, it's sad, but it's funny because of how much of a mess it is. But, um, a friend sent that video and I was watching it thinking like, well, what if this was all intentional? What if they, uh, weren't supposed to be syncing up with a conductor? Uh, what if they're, what if the conductor just became another singer? Like they gave one cue to start and then everyone moved at their own pace. Um, and that was all intentional chaos. Uh, yeah. Right. And so does that mean it's different every time? It's the yeah, absolutely. Too? I have a recording of I Hope You're Doing Well up on my website. Um, and I've gotten, I think, at least two other recordings from groups that have done that. But it's really, um, I think it's uh, I don't know if it's the first time that I've written a piece that's really just for the people who are creating it in the moment and not for an audience. And that was like, I thought that really interested me too. Yeah. Um, that's something we don't really do as composers. Uh, we might be thinking about, you know, creating a piece like you obviously write a ton of orchestra music and you're trying to think, I would assume about keeping everyone, in the orchestra relatively engaged and, um, maybe not happy, but, uh, but <laughs> not like bored. Yeah. Not bored. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just giving them something interesting to do at some point in the piece and things, moments to look forward to and anticipate. And, and then you're also thinking, or I know as a composer, I'm always thinking too about what the audience response might be, especially if there's yeah. text, I'm thinking, how is the text moving them through an emotional journey and how is the music, um, enhancing that journey or complementing it? And, yeah, and so this, both pieces are not, they're not really for the audience. You can do them and yeah. record them and have people watch, but it's really just, it's purely a way of making music with each other in a situation where, at least back in March, we were told we couldn't make any music with right. each other from a choral perspective. Do you also kind of imagine that it could be performed live eventually when, yeah? Yeah, that's even part of the uh, part of the instructions. Uh, say like if it's performed live, you should be staggered six feet apart. So like even if they're performed five or ten years from now, um, the idea that we should still be able to see that the singers are distanced, which again is was kind of like a silly thing when I wrote it. Like it was a bit tongue in cheek, I guess, but also it is a way of I think preserving this moment and maybe people won't want to reconnect with this moment in time i don't know it's so hard it's when we're going through something and going through something globally too yeah. um to know what it's going to feel like when it's over obviously this was an unplanned right. time where everything kind of got canceled all at once but then suddenly i had all the time in the world right. so it was yeah, yeah cooking a lot um 
and reading and uh, just trying to get through each day individually, I think, and, and minimize anxiety. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, not necessarily trying to be productive because I didn't have to be. I think it's really important as an artist to recognize those times when you don't actually have to be producing things all the time and to build in that space for yourself too, to build in those moments where you know you can take a break and you know you can rest. But you were also writing fiction, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been taking a fiction writing workshop. Like it's something I just enjoy doing and it does feel like I'm missing something or like I'm sh almost like shutting off a part of myself when I'm not writing words. Uh, oh, yeah. It feels like I'm actively neglecting something. So it does feel like in order to be a complete version of myself, I have to be writing music and writing words. Um, not always at the exact same time, but, uh, but that has to be a part of my life. And usually I have something, um, even if I'm not actively working on writing, I'm taking notes in my phone or in a journal or on my computer somewhere for something that I'll write in the future. When I'm writing nonfiction, it feels like a way to process um, what's working or what's not working in my creative career, in my creative life, in my personal life. Um, and then fiction is an extension of that too, except it's um, merging personal experience with fiction, with <laughs> false, false narratives. Um, but it's all in pursuit, I think, of processing, um, of just, of like making sense of something. Right. of like taking a little kernel of truth and then spinning that out and seeing um, maybe what conclusion I can draw from it and also trying to be helpful with that information. Um, if it's nonfiction, I want to take something that I've learned and present that information in a way that might be helpful to someone else. What kinds of uh, topics do you feel are important to address in your nonfiction work? Really, it's just everything that we aren't taught as composers and as musicians in school. Um, things we don't get in private lessons, things we might even get the wrong information or, or explicitly unhelpful information. Um, like the, the idea, say, that we're supposed to be going for things all the time, um, like being the most productive versions of ourselves possible, like these, these narratives that aren't necessarily helpful to a creative life, especially when we're thinking long term and we're trying to avoid burnout. Um, yeah, so and even like I the that's sort of the creative mental side of things, but I also really enjoy talking about um, like money and uh, networking like these these right. things that again we aren't taught in school um, right the logistics yeah. of having a career as an artist so we've been friends for 10 years 10, yeah almost 11 oh, that's such a long time oh my god a whole decade yeah we've been friends for a whole decade <laughs> um and i mean i really have to say that like so much of what I've learned about my own anxiety and my own process has come from our conversations. Mm -hmm. And so it's really exciting to have you on the show. <laughs> and also, you know, when you published your book last year, um, it was kind of like, for me, it felt like reading everything that we had ever talked about, just like in a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that I could I could reference it. The book is called um, Staying Composed, Overcoming Anxiety and Self-Doubt Within a Creative Life. And um, well, can you can you tell us what it's about? Yeah, so it's it's loosely grouped. Um, it's sort of grouped in two ways where it's going uh, almost chronologically through the issues you might face. Uh, as a creative person, um, but it's also going from sort of from micro to macro, so from smaller issues, um, like just overcoming procrastination, although I say smaller issues, that can be a really big issue, <laughs> just yeah. sitting down to get started is so often the hardest part of any project, 
Um, but yeah, overcoming procrastination and just making room in your schedule to do the kind of work you want to be doing. Um, and then if that's at the start of the book, then the end is much broader issues like how do you, what happens when you are achieving success, but you're still feeling um, like imposter syndrome or you're still feeling, maybe you're feeling really empty after you finish a big project and you're going through like a success hangover and you're sort of doubting your work or you're doubting yourself or wondering what you'll possibly create next. Um, so yeah, so the, the book starts sort of early and small and then ends um, later and more in a more expansive abstract sort of way dealing with bigger issues. And um, I love it because yeah. there's a lot of, um, I mean, it feels to me very much like it's your voice. Like it's very, um, uh, it's very practical and whimsical and there's, you know, it's poetic too, but it's also very direct and, you know, just like kind of no nonsense, <laughs> you know, this is, this is what, you know, you talk about what you found helpful and it's really kind of, well, especially for, for composers and I think classical musicians, one of the only books out there on this topic. I mean, what, what books um, were you sort of inspired by when you were writing this? Yeah, I actually, there's so many books like this for writers. Um, and my favorite, I think the first one I ever read was Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. And I know a lot of composers too who have read that book and really found it helpful. But there's some things that musicians deal with that writers don't. And I just, I wasn't finding a book about creativity. There are plenty of, um, there are composer memoirs or autobiographies. Um, Articles. Articles, yeah, yeah, lots of articles, but I wanted a, I wanted a book. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I wanted to write the book that I wanted and needed when I was like in my early, like very early 20s right. um, or even my mid 20s. And just feeling like I, I know like when I came out of grad school, I knew I wanted to take at least three years off before getting a DMA if, if ever getting a DMA. Right. And I've decided since not yeah. to get a DNA, but I, um, yeah, I just wanted answers. I wanted answers to all of the logistical questions, but I also wanted answers to all of the mental hurdles. And um, I, I say in the book that I thought about trying to write one book that answered all the questions, and actually that's probably right. several different books. But yeah, this one answers most, if not all, of the um just the questions of like, how do you go about making art for the rest of your life? Right. And not, and I think the biggest thing that we talked about a lot was sort of leaving grad school was this idea of in graduate school, it's constantly go, 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 deadline to deadline to deadline. Um, you know, staying up all night, writing, doing homework, teaching. And then when you're out of school and you're actually trying to create your own career, you realize that that lifestyle for, well, I'll just say for us, seemed to not be sustainable or desirable even. And so like, then what? Then what do right. you do? <laughs> right, well, and then even, I know like for me having commission, or commission, composing lessons um, every week is not, it's not how I work best. I work best with deadlines, like I said, and I, I work, um, I like to know when my deadline is and then be ramping up towards that deadline so that I'm working a little bit every day on sketches in the early phases of the process. And then I'm working really intensely on that piece where that's sort of all I'm doing in right. leading up to the deadline. Whereas lessons are just kind of assuming you're bringing in the same amount and the same kind of work every week. And that was not, I, um, yeah. at least one professor, I think I say this in the book too, was I <laughs> was surprised when I, I finished my piano concerto and he was like, I, there's half of this I didn't see. <laughs> like he wrote half a piano concerto in like two weeks. And I was like, this is how I work though. Yeah. And then was it right before, or maybe it was even the, the day of publication or right before or right after publication of your book that you released an article 
on the music box. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah. So the article is called Don't Wait Until You Hear Sirens. And uh, it actually, so it addresses how the time, I, first of all, I don't know why I decided to put this book out a month before getting married, uh, which seems absurd when I say it out loud uh, and was absurd. In April, um, I, I like almost had a panic attack in Grand Central Station. I was in New York for a premiere. Um, and then that combined with just breaking down in tears, like sobbing on the floor multiple times, um, back at home in LA, those experiences cumulatively made me realize that I, like, I've been coping with anxiety my entire life. I, I knew that, right? Like, right. that's something I've known about myself for a really long time. Um, but those experiences happening at that time made me realize that I should try medication, which I hadn't tried uh, yet for my anxiety. And, um, yeah, so now I'm, I'm still on that medication. I'm taking Zoloft uh, and, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's been really helpful. Um, even for the, the wedding, like knowing myself and knowing how I obsess over certain scenarios or certain um, things I could have said differently or done differently or this feeling of like wondering constantly if I'm doing enough or if I'm um, just like being enough and, and getting enough done. The going on medication was really helpful for uh, reducing those thought patterns. Um, and like just for letting me get through my wedding and then the rest of my life without, um, <laughs> well, that remains to be seen, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully that'll be here. You made it so far, yeah. six months in. So pandemic, far. So far. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but no, but just getting through without, um, losing, without losing sight of a bigger perspective, like without getting so into specific details that I'm unable to function. And that, that is like the worst of my anxiety is, is dwelling so intensely on something that I can't move past it. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah, that it's this sort of um, micromanaging, micro focus, um, and that you get, just from my experience, like you get so tangled in these thoughts that kind of keep spinning out that you forget what was even going on. At least right. I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Where or, did this or you, start? Where did this thought pattern start? Or you just com completely lose perspective that maybe this thing you're worrying about, maybe it matters, but it matters, you know, this tiny amount instead of like the rest of what you're doing matters in a very large and significant way. And so actually what you're worrying about doesn't need that much of your attention. Right. I remember one of the big breakthroughs I had reading your book was... Um, you have a moment where you say when you're having anxious thoughts like try to slow down and think about what if it's something that you really can control or not and if you can't to try to I don't remember if you said let it go or put it aside but but you think differently about it and I remember reading that and realizing that in those sort of moments of high anxiety I am not aware or I, I have trouble discerning what I can and can't control and that was sort of like a big uh, discovery for me yeah I, I like also to I like to uh, like sort of go through an exercise where I think about when I have to worry about something um, and I talk about that in the book too and even regardless of that control issue which well, honestly, there's so much that we can't control. And that's that's been like mind blowing to me yeah. to have that realization about my creative work and to um, really just change how I think about my work that way. But also to think, you know, I could worry about um, 
like an upcoming trip or something in, in normal times about travel that's coming up. I could worry about it just right up until it happens starting now, or I could acknowledge that I can't control how the trip goes until the trip happens. And so I can plan out like really when I'm going to start worrying about it, which maybe yeah. sounds, no, sounds I, strange. Yeah, like, it. can you control but you, but I think you can, if you train your brain to like to notice every time your thoughts go to a specific thing and to just recognize that and tell yourself or ask yourself, like, is this the right time to worry about this? And can I control this? And if the answer is no to both questions, you consciously shift your thoughts back to something else and just keep doing that. Like it's it's a practice. It, yeah. It's like exercising, like you have to do it regularly or you don't get the benefits of it. Like yeah. you get, you know, it, you have to spend, again, spend your whole life doing that, but it does become easier to notice. The noticing becomes so much easier. Yes. And then the redirecting becomes easier too, I think. Yeah. And then like for us to have each other or like to have our, you know, you have your husband and um, like to have somebody help you monitor that is also really helpful too, to like speak it out loud. Yeah. Luke, uh, my husband will actually go, he'll, he'll say like, Dale, you're spiraling. And I'm like, I know. And sometimes it's to the point where sometimes I'm like, I know this sounds like I'm spiraling, but I'm not spiraling I'm not. because I'm not. <laughs> and then sometimes I'm like, no, but you're right. I'm still spiraling. Right. Yeah. And even I, like I should say too, I wrote the book for myself in a way too, yes. just because putting a name to all of these things, um, whether it's the uh, period of time in a project where I hate everything I've done thus far, like giving that a name, right. um, just giving every part of my process a name makes it less threatening and yes. just less scary to go through that. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, I've done this. I've been here before. I've right. been here so many times before and I always get through it and I will get through right. it again this time. Like when I wake up, I'm like, okay, these are my morning anxieties. My, I don't want to, you know, sit down today. They're, it's not new information. Right. I think that's another big one, too, is like, is this new information that you need to pay attention to? Or are these old thoughts that you've had forever that just constantly show up? But Right. But if they haven't, if they are old and they haven't like, ruined your life yet, like also probably they're not going to like, maybe you can just kind of let them go. If they've been around their old news, maybe you can just put them aside and practice yeah. Practice that a lot until it gets easier right. noticing what is old news in your mind. My Whether therapist always yeah. says, um, she says, you can say, um, okay, thank you for sharing. Now put your head down. <laughs> like, okay, I heard you. But like a kid, like you yeah. sort of talk to your anxiety like a, like a little kid having a tantrum or something. Right. Um, or like a, a but made me think of like a kid who won't stop talking in class or something who's like mm -hmm. always like calling me and you're like i i see you yes you can share briefly and then we're gonna hear from other people right. in the class you don't know everything no <laughs> i've always known to some extent that i like i worry about things more than the average person um sure. and i I had like a therapist visit um, in high school, like a one-off visit where she, I think she implied like, like you, you think a lot, like you overthink things, like you think too much. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't think, how do you think too much? Because I can't stop thinking. But of course what she meant is the, the way that you're thinking about things, yes. like the way that you're approaching things. But she also worded it in kind of a strange not super helpful way, okay, um, bad which maybe is why I did not, yeah, why yeah. that was a one-off <laughs> session. Um, but yeah, but uh, I think the first, like the first indicator that it maybe was a bigger deal um, was moving to Los Angeles 11 years ago. And I actually, I did the classic thing where you're panicking and you think that something is physically wrong with your heart like I, I for me anxiety manifests as chest clenching mm -hmm. um, and I've been noticing that since college 
Um, and actually, I used to have a friend in college um, who had the same thing, and I think she called it like her monster, and she gave it a name like the, that lives inside her chest. And for me, it's just a feeling. It's how I know that I'm going through anxiety or that I need to change something in my life. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's sometimes it's a good thing because it's right. a sign that the way I'm going about a situation in my life is wrong and I need to make a change. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I, I had a chest clenchy moment that sent me to the health center um, thinking that something was really wrong with me. And um, I was sent away with a, it wasn't Xanax, it was... Ativan or something? Ativan, yes. Yeah. I was sent away with an Ativan prescription, which I didn't use very much, but enjoyed knowing that it was there, um, yeah. which was helpful. In your experience um, writing, has there been any points where there's kind of an intersection between your experience with anxiety and your experience writing? Um, do they inform one another? Do they harm one another? Do they talk to each other? Um, I'm just curious kind of what you think the relationship is, if there is one, between your anxiety and your creativity. I think um, a lot of this, again, is, is what I talk about in Staying Composed, um, about this, uh, this relationship where, to some extent, the, the urges or the impulses behind the anxiety are a good thing. And I'm not saying that the anxiety itself is good, and I'm definitely not saying that it feels good, but I'm saying that I think the, again, the, like the instincts there can be good in that, say, second guessing something that I've written can be a good thing because that's also part of what makes me a good editor. And that yes. is a crucial part of my process is getting out... Um, how do you feel about cursing on this podcast? Oh, it's fine. I, I don't know. I was going to say getting out what Anne Lamott calls shitty first drafts. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then once that draft exists, then going, uh, going back and knowing that I'm a good editor and knowing that I will turn that into something really good, those editing instincts of like, oh, this, this is bad. Like, I should revise this. I should rewrite it. That's those are all good instincts. Um, but the extreme version of that, where it's like thinking everything is terrible um, or that I need to really just ditch everything I've written so far, like that's not good. Right. Um, that's definitely not an urge that I want to follow. Um, so, and I, I do think like it's, anxiety amplifies some of these things that can be good and right. for me what's worked um, is again coming back to the idea of labeling of knowing what I'm doing and then recognizing when anxiety is magnifying something into something that's very negative um, while not shutting down that impulse altogether. So it sounds like you you one have a very clear understanding of your process and like the different ups and downs within your process. And then you've maybe, I won't say embraced that there's anxiety in it, but maybe accepted that there are periods of anxiety within the process. And you, but you kind of know, it sounds like you're saying, you know when they are typically. And so when they pop up, they don't derail you as much as if you were kind of just in a free for all. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly it, um, and it is it's hard to embrace uh, the sort of shadow side elements of our creative process. But I think it is, um, in, uh, again, in the, in the book I talk about it, like maybe seeing seeing someone you never really liked from high school or something, like you see them and. You, it like maybe makes you feel nostalgic about high school, but also you don't like the person or something. I kind of feel like that with these uh, anxious urges that I know are coming. I'm like, ah, oh, yes, here you are again. Like the urge to throw everything I've written out the window, like welcome. Yeah. I knew you were coming. And the fact that you're here means that I'm right on track with this piece. And also now I'll just 
take a day off from my work until you go away because I don't want to hang out with you right now. How did you, I mean, it's a really profound thing that you're saying. How did you get to that point? That's a good question. I think it really, it really just, it starts with just labeling okay. in every, in every piece that you do, like labeling those things so that then you can get to the point where you sort of detach yourself from them. And that's not to say that it doesn't still feel bad. Like I still yeah. feel bad even at the same time as I'm like, oh, here it is again, the day where everything sucks. Um, yeah. It still feels bad to have that happen, but because I've been through it so many times, I know what to do. And for me, the answer is to step away from my work for a day or three um, sure. and then come back to it again. Like if, yeah, like it feels bad in your body, right? But like you're... Yeah, it, it feels really frustrating, I yeah. think, more than anything. It's yeah. it's. Because it, it doesn't feel great, like, as someone who's creative, when you sit down to create something and nothing's coming, it feels yeah. terrible. But if it, like, if you know that sitting down to get started is really hard, and so what you're telling yourself is, from past experience, I know I just have to get literally anything down on the page, and then I'll come back later, that makes it a lot easier to get started than yeah. thinking, oh, like, I have to start this project, and it has to be really good because it's for this like this person or this ensemble yeah. that I, I really like I want them to think it's really good and I want to think it's really good. like that's not helpful really what you're talking about is kind of extreme self-awareness of, of how you think and so how um, how have you done that like how have you cultivated that practice so one thing that's really helped is keeping a five-year journal which I've been doing for four and a half years so I'm almost at the end of my journal um, and it's 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 really interesting to see how seasonal um, some of my creative. So we're talking sort of on on a smaller scale about every piece that I write. But there are like I think there are times of year where I go through um, more anxiety or I'm just feeling really down about myself and my work. Um, like a certain week in April or something like I can look back at this journal because the way it's the way it's lined up is you can see previous years on any given day that you're writing you see what you wrote the year before wow. so now on year five I can look back and I can see if like every other day every other September 18th I felt a certain way then I know to look out for that um, you know, in future years, but also, so that's like, that's a really big scale, but also I can see, of course, when I'm in the middle of a project or at the start yeah. of a project, um, how I'm feeling and yeah. what's triggering that. I can see what's around it because what else am I writing about? Um, what else am I feeling? What else has happened in my life? Right. So you're yeah, doing kind of yeah. what you would do in a therapy setting. So I, I have not been to therapy. There's that one off time, right? <laughs> Yeah. with a not great therapist but I am I'm really big on self-inquiry and yeah and writing did, did you have any kind of um shame or feelings of resistance towards medication going on the medication I think I had gotten to the point where I tried coping with things myself and it was just very explicitly clear at that point in my life um a year and a half ago now, um, that what I was doing on my own was not cutting it. Uh, yeah. And I, like, I could see it, my partner could see it, like, I was sobbing on the floor a lot. Like, it's not normal behavior. Yeah. Um, it just feeling completely overwhelmed and, and helpless, really. Like, that's, it, it was really bad. And I went to the doctor, like, I went to my primary care physician and they give you a little anxiety quiz that's like how many days a week are you feeling terrible about everything and I like I just all the questions I was like I just I feel terrible all the time it was not great but if in that way it was also very clear to me yeah. that it was time to try an anti-anxiety drug like right. it just yeah so there there wasn't doubt in my mind about trying it. Of course, I was like scared to try 
I, it's honestly, like any new medication, I'm like a, a little bit of a, a, not a hypochondriac, I don't know what the right word is, um, but where I'm like, what if this, like medicate, what if I have all the bad side effects? And yeah, it's a funny thing to say hypochondriac about taking medication, like that almost it seems like <laughs> it shouldn't go together. <laughs> But it's anxiety. It's, it's right. Yeah. It's like imagining the worst case scenario for everything. Right. Were you concerned about um, it affecting your creativity? I don't think I was. Okay. Because I think, again, like I, I clearly wasn't getting anything. To, like anxiety was affecting my creativity right. so badly at that point. And I should say too, it doesn't. Obviously, it doesn't, I hope it's obvious, it doesn't have to be that bad for you to start medication. Yeah. Like, when I did try Zoloft for the first time, I was like, oh, I should have tried this years ago. Yeah. Yeah, Like, probably in college, I think I would have been a lot happier um, in college and in grad school. Um, And a lot of this again, like self-inquiry, like we've been talking about, a lot of that works for me and it's been working for a really long time, but that doesn't have to be the only thing. And that right. shouldn't be the only thing. If if there are things you haven't tried that could be helping you, I think it's always better to try. Yeah. Yeah. How would you describe that the medication has affected uh, your thoughts? I think... Again, it comes back to that stopping the the spiraling about things and the blowing things out of proportion completely. Um, and it's not perfect. I still I yeah. still am anxious about things, um, but that it's it doesn't feel like anything is unmanageable. What sort of in addition to medication and and journaling and obviously creating art, um, sort of. Well, I guess it's two questions. Have you been able to focus this week um, with all the wildfires and you're right in, um, you're right below the the Bobcat fire. And um, yeah, what other practices do you have? My preferred exercise is long walks and yoga. And those both really help um, with my mental well-being and my physical well-being. I have a deadline coming up October 1st. And also I was so, I've been so distraught about the fires that I haven't um, been able to get that much done. But also if I do yoga and if I am sort of gentle with myself, like if I'm not forcing myself to do too much, I've found I can still, I can always get a little bit done each day. And so when that feels like enough, then I let that be enough. And when I can, when I'm able to get like many hours of work done, then that's great too. Um, and so, and another, another strategy that I've been using lately and that I use in general when I'm feeling just so like completely burnt out on uh, creative acts, or I feel like I just physically cannot create anything is I save the busy work. Um, the editing and engraving things and that's mindless it's you have to make little choices about how to notate things but it i can do that when i feel completely uncreative right so you kind of save your because that's still composing i mean you're still working on your piece yes it's just um takes a different level of energy and focus yeah there definitely are times um even talking about all of these strategies and all of these things that make it possible to be creative most of the time. There certainly are days where I don't feel like doing anything. And um, it's a lot harder when there are things like fires or political events. It doesn't make you want to like sit down and imagine a A concerto. (laughs) But then when you do, it's really rewarding. Yes. Just that hour of creative time or however long it is, that feels like its own reward. Yeah. Um, that that feels, just no matter where I am in my process or what's happening around me, if I can get that hour done, that is something that creatively like nourishes me um, and, and is just such a positive for like my own well-being, my mental yeah. health. I think... 
why it was so hard for me, why it took me so long to share my anxiety publicly, even though all my friends knew, was that I was still ashamed of it. I mean, I have to say that a, another sort of impetus for sharing um, publicly that I have anxiety, um, I mean, there were a lot of things leading up to it, but I feel like one of them was your tweet uh, <laughs> um, where you um, shared like sort of more personal information about yourself that also surprised me. So I don't know, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I decided to publicly come out as bisexual, um, which is something I've known about myself for a long time and just generally don't talk about. The reason that I felt like I needed to share publicly that I'm bi um, is because to not do so felt like keeping a secret. Yeah. And that just started to feel like just bad, bad. I don't know, like kind of gross and bad, um, especially because it's so easy. Um, like if you are attracted to men and women and you're you only in my case, I've only been in heterosexual appearing relationships my whole life. But that doesn't negate the fact that I am bi. For all intents and purposes, we're in a heterosexual marriage, right? But it felt, it felt like to not acknowledge that I was bi would be to be hiding it on purpose. Yeah. Which was just a feeling I didn't want anymore. Um, right. Cause in it, my life. Yeah. Yeah. It, Cause then it's like, well, are you ashamed of it? The idea of, um, sharing something that feel, especially something that feels private. Right. Like, or, or maybe doesn't feel relevant unless you're specifically writing a piece about like being anxious or like being on medication. I don't know if it would come up right in your right. professional life. Right. But, um, but the more, and this is something we've talked about, you and I have talked about many times is yeah. I think that just sharing, um, whether it's like we're sharing, talking about experiences with each other um, or whether we're talking about experiences with everyone, um, just talking about them makes them makes them human and makes like hopefully anyone listening to that discussion of an experience will feel like their experience is human too. Um, if there's any, any element of a shared experience there and if it is the same experience, then there's just such an immense sense of validation. It's, it's scary to talk about these things. I know I'm sure it felt scary to talk about being on medication like for the first time for you as well, probably. But yeah, but when we get over that, it, like being on the other side of that fear feels so good. Yeah. The pandemic, this experience that we're all going through together, but that is also very personal. It's been um, a time to really like reckon with what um, I guess just for me, it's like what I want to be doing with my time and also just who I who I want to be, who I am and how I'm expressing that. Allowing myself to be vulnerable and like open in the name of maybe in the name of like not putting up unnecessary boundaries or borders between who I am and who I am in a public facing way. Right, right. Yeah, and just that this is a difficult time and the more open and empathetic we can be with one another, it sort of eases some of the difficulties, I think, of this period. Yeah, I think, again, it creates space for more empathy um, and like, I feel like that's, we need we need that now more than ever. We need empathy. Well, if um, listeners want to find you and or find your book, your music, where can they do that? Uh, everything. I think everything is linked through daletrumbor.com. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. But yeah, the best way I think is always just to reach out with an email. Learning to live with any kind of mental illness or disorder or emotional struggle, trauma. It takes years of practice, but the good news is that there are many tools and resources out there to start feeling better. 
And I want to echo what Dale said, which is that you don't have to necessarily be experiencing the most severe manifestation of these struggles. You could just be having a hard time, um, as many of us are during this pandemic. And that's enough to warrant, you know, talking to trusted friends or health professionals and just exploring different ways and different options to feel better and take care of your mental and physical health. So thanks, Dale, for your wonderful thoughts and friendship. And thank you for listening.